Hey guys, so Sonder had um, discussed with me that we should probably do a video on the top 10 tools to find your homestead because our previous video, we talked about finding a homestead and some of it was tools, but some of it was also some of the softer skills that we learned along the way. So in this video, we're gonna focus mainly on the tools. You know, there's, there's a couple of tools that we've discovered over time that have really helped us get a lot of information about you know, the properties that we're looking at. When you're searching for a property and you find something on Trulia, usually you find a listing like this. And this one actually got sold, but it was a very interesting one. You could see it has a really beautiful barn. Oh, that barn. got sold? Oh, that was going to get sold so quickly. Yeah, it's going to yeah. get sold. It's got a nice house, a nice barn. Uh, this was like a historic piece landscape. of land. Yeah, beautiful. It's got a pond. Um, so I thought this would be a good example to just quickly look at how we approach like digging into some of this and finding out more information about this property. So obviously, look at that monstera plant. I know, look there, <laughs> and I was like rep looking at the cornice above the uh, the dogwood. <laughs> so uh, obviously, the sales page has a lot of information on it, and actually try to find the property on all these other websites too, like Zillow or uh, you know sometimes even Instagram has a lot of properties on it, surprisingly. There's real estate agents that use Instagram as like posting properties. So mm -hmm. what we would do is we would just grab the address right here, copy it. And then first thing we would do, we would go to a website called Acre Value and punch it in there. It's like a Google search engine for properties. And then it finds the property. And all of a sudden you're greeted with these orange lines, which are the property lines. And you can now get a sense of what that property looks like. In the distance, there's power lines that run through oh, that potentially because yeah. they have this cutout in the woods. Yeah, yeah, I believe there's power lines here. So immediately, you know, from this beautiful listing, you know, we were able to figure out already that it has power lines. The property is shaped this way. It's 30 acres. And uh, you can see there's a lot more information available for this, but we actually need to log in. So, uh, so you got to create a login and all of a sudden you get more information about the property. So here, this apparently is the owner. There's also a date. Uh, it has a slope, your idea of slope, which we talked about before. Mm -hmm. Forest, grass, like how much percentage is uh, present on the property. And uh, you can also get a full report. And I believe this is something that you eventually pay for on this website. You can but get I'm not so, quite sure. You can get a few, a few of them before you have to actually yeah. like pay and log in. So you can download it here at the top. Um, Which is very helpful because yeah. again, if you're planning on, do, you know, especially for a lot of a lot of folks like looking for farmland, knowing your soils is really helpful. And this gives you a more, you know, generic view of your soils based on like the USDA soil maps. Um, I would always encourage people to get your soil tested, like we're doing that as well. But this will give you a really beautiful overview of your soils and how productive that land is or was. So one of the things that you could see is that if you move to this area, you will be one of the biggest landowners in the area. Um, you could see that Cornell University owns this land, so you know that that one probably won't, won't be, uh, developed. be developed. Yeah. Uh, although it looks like they cut out all these other little shapes <laughs> from that parcel, so they may be selling off little slices of their land and to have it developed. And then uh, another thing you notice here is that you have Alice Hollow Community Center. So Alice Hollow, here you have the website for that. So, you know, now you can find out a lot more information about it because what I found on this uh, website was that they actually have a lot of like events that they have in the summer months. If you have children yeah. and you, you know, you can bring them to swimming right lessons to the, right, right in the your backyard. Yeah, you could have just walked yeah. them there. They could walk themselves there. So that could be very handy. That's super handy. Uh, and they also have tennis courts you can see. Um, so there's a lot of information that you can glance from that. Another tool that we saw a real estate agent use, and that is on X Hunt. Game changer. <laughs> Game changing app, because this is actually an app that is used uh, in the hunting world to figure out where you can hunt and who owns what property so you're not accidentally like hunting on someone else's land. Uh, so they have a great mobile app actually. So this is what you could use in the field. I'll just pull it up real quick. Especially when you're walking on land. Right, yeah. so here is Onyx Hunt and you can see all these shapes that I drew on it because those are, you know, you, those are the drawing tools that they have. So here, for example, we can see that same property that we were just looking at. You can see the water over here. 
And another thing that this map does is it shows a great elevation mm. because obviously when you're hunting, it's very important to know about. So one thing that you can figure out here is that you wetlands can look at the, too, uh, which is great. yeah, you can see some wetlands yeah. here in the back. But one thing that I noticed from looking at this property was if you look at the elevation lines, there's a really, really steep hill over here that goes from, you know, where the property is at 1150, it goes all the way up to 1450. And that mountain that's there, or that huge hill, is actually located towards the south of the property. So that means that in the winter months, when the sun is lower in the sky, it might block a lot of that light yeah. when you're moving there. So that's a thing to consider. Like if you, if you plan to buy your property to grow most of your own food and you're mostly shaded out, you know, those are things that you can all start to realize when you start using some of these tools. What I started doing is like here, you could see all the other shapes. Like every time I would see Cornell, I would draw a, uh, a line around it. Which is so helpful because we saw yeah. some really great land and we're like, oh, who owns that? And then we go on the map and we're like, oh, like it's eye Cornell. roll, like Cornell owns it. Cornell, Cornell is, came in and owned, like bought up Cornell everything. Cornell owns, like, they're the second largest land owner in New York State, aside for New York State, which is crazy. Yeah. But, you know, you might want to be a budding up against one of their lands or like in a land trust land yeah. or whatever, or a, or a state park or national park, because then you're kind of protected in protected. a way, which is really That's nice. That's something with the, um, here, what we'll do is, uh, so here you can have great drawing tools. Mm -hmm. So you can click on area shape and then you can just start drawing and you can also see it measures the yards. Uh, so you could just quickly put this on the map like this. And then uh, what I would do is I would make that uh, line color blue and then I would just save it. And then that would be a property that we would be interested in mm -hmm. and that would appear on the map. Um, another thing that I was just thinking of like, yeah, it's really nice to be near land that's owned by like a land trust because you know it's not going to be developed. But you could see there's not really much land trust around here. Yeah, Purple kind is of where is, I, yeah it's kind of more in the that ring around. Yeah, I believe this is, yeah, here's Finger Lakes Land Trust. So, you know, having land that butts up against that is good. Yeah, all the stuff that you have brown is, is like Cornell Land yeah, Trust, Cornell State Park, Trust. you know. And that's another thing, like mm -hmm. um, being next to State Park, I think is different from like having state lands because yeah. state forest lands, because on state parks, you know, you're not going to be hunting because there's people always walking on that land. But state forest lands, you'll get um, selective cutting, you'll get hunters in there. So if that's something that you don't want to hear, I mean... You know, we're in the country. You're gonna you're gonna have that. There's hunting is a big thing here, and we don't have it on our land, but people around here have it on their land, and yeah. uh, and so those are things that are like U, um, ATVs or UTVs, ATV, snowmobiles, things snowmobiles. like that. Like you may be into it or you yeah. may not be into it, but that's something that you should really like think about when yeah. you start to move. To so the yeah, country. that could be the greatest thing ever because you could go in your backyard mm -hmm. and get straight into the you know state forest and drive your UTV around or you know like snowmobile. Uh, another thing that you can notice is that maybe the property next door is owned by a logging company. And then you're like, okay, well, maybe, you know, you gotta be careful with uh, where you're looking. But tools like this will make that immediately clear. So before you waste any of your own time, you can really get the sense of what this is. And then another thing might be is that the property you're looking at is kind of landlocked, but it has one of those fingers out towards the road that mm -hmm. you were talking about. Mm -hmm. like. So you, it may look like a good property, but then you realize that, you know, there's there's some challenges with it. This is a great example. Look at that Oh, one. yeah. yeah. There we go. So it might look like something like this. Well, this yeah. is actually a stone quarry. Oh, yeah. I forgot that. And this is, uh, you know, once you mm -hmm. switch to the hybrid map, you can also get a lot more detail. It's like, yeah, if, if you have a view that looks out on this, you know, that might be something that you... You, uh, or hearing everybody yeah, quarry. Yeah, or hearing a yeah, quarry yeah. that's grinding stone all day or whatever, mm -hmm. or digging stone all day. That's, again, with heavy machinery. So this can also give you a lot of information. Onyx Hunt, the pricing is like 30 bucks or a 30 year. bucks a year mm -hmm. for uh, one state. So that's great. Like, it's relatively cheap. Another tool that's very similar to that is MapRite. And MapRite is a tool that costs a bit more, I believe. Um, it's like 40 bucks a month but you have a free trial. First of all, you can see all the property lines again, but you have a lot of layers that you can turn on and off. 
So here, for example, I've turned on wetlands and water features. So when I do that, you know, you could see where certain rivers are, streams, where ponds are, wetlands. We've already discovered this from uh, the Onyx hunt map. Yeah, you but don't want to be building next to there. I mean, we, we were traveling and looking at land during the summer, during a time of a drought. And you might say, oh, wow, this is pretty dry. But then you find out during the spring or the fall months that it could be actually very wet there. You don't want to be building on a floodplain or no, on wetlands. You won't be able to. There's so. all kinds of rules for that. Yeah. And you don't want your property to be flooding when there's a heavy you know, weather event or something. Now, there's all kinds of layers in here. You have soils, something that we were able to get from acre value. Here you can get it for the entire map. You have contour lines, which are the lines that you could see that there's a big hill here. Uh, railroads, FSA, which I believe it has something to do with farm stuff. Public lands you can turn on and off. Again, yeah. floodplain, very, very helpful to know. Yeah, so that's when Don't things are flooding. Don't build on a floodplain. <laughs> um, so school districts, opportunity zones, there's just tons of layers here. And actually, and we, we found out that, you know, for school districts, the real estate agents aren't supposed to really give advice on school districts, we, we heard, or that yeah. was like some kind of um, a thing. Because so, they don't, they don't want to show their bias. Yeah, they exactly. Oh, like this to. is a really good school district and you don't want to be there. You know, they can't show that. It's part of their like integrity of being a real estate agent. So you might need to do that research yourself, but there's uh, plenty of information online about schools. I think even Zillow and Trulia have things like that. So you could see what kind of school districts are around your area, especially if you have children or you're planning to have children. Yep, and they also have a bunch of other like maps, they even have infrared. Hmm. And what that could be good for sometimes, I believe, is uh, just seeing where forests are. Mm -hmm. Because I, I think that those show up as pink and then fields show up as cyan. So, you know, you have all kinds of different maps that you can throw at this. Yeah, I believe they even have maps for where oil wells are. So, mm -hmm. you know, you could figure out if there's a lot of, you know, oil in your area. Well, somewhere. especially it's like in Pennsylvania, that was one of the states that we didn't want to look to because... They right. have a lot of fracking and kind of open gas wells and things like that. So we were just like, okay, forget that. <laughs> Let's look over the border at New York. Yeah. My Maps, which is something that Google makes, it allows you to make more custom maps. So I think that here, yeah, here, what you do is you go to mymaps.google.com and then you could start building your own map. So when we were doing a lot of research, we started to put together this map. So here's a property that we actually considered which was on Nelson Road. And we started to just collect information about our neighbors. Um, you know, once you have a map like this, you get to find out who owns the property. So you could search for their name on Google and potentially get more information about that person. Uh, I believe we found out that one of these people worked at a company that was nearby or maybe they have their main living address somewhere else in New Jersey or in New York. So, you know, this is kind of a vacation home kind of thing. Uh, so here, for example, you could see that, you know, we found that this place is on Airbnb and there's another Airbnb down here. Oh, which is so cool because then you get a sense of, which is great. Um, you know, the other aspects of the, of the area and yeah. they usually have like really good photos of like the outdoors and you're like, Oh, that's, I get a sense of what it actually looks like even if I haven't even walked on the land. That's another great thing to do is like looking at Airbnb and what kind of houses are in the area. Or stay there. Get, or like, even stay yeah, there. Or even we stay we there. did that. We like did sometimes that like times. the Airbnbs, yeah. we'd always stay at a different one to just get a sense of the place and say, okay, what is it like actually living here? The probably the most serious tool of all of them. And it's this is if you're like a real freaking nerd. Uh, I actually had to consult with one of your old professors yeah. on figuring out how how it works. Thank and, you, Art Lembo. Yes. You're awesome. <laughs> and he actually put together a course, which I was able to follow on, figuring out how some of this works. But to be honest, I may have already kind of forgotten how most of it works. I have to tell but, you, I'm like over a, you know, a dozen years removed from a geographic information systems, yeah, and that which is, is what it is. The but... tool that we're talking about is GIS. Mm -hmm. And there's a couple applications that you can... Uh, use GIS in. So GIS is just map data that the government also gathers about every state and every place. And you can download that data and then you need an editor. Uh, there's multiple editors. The one that I've been using is QGIS. And in that editor, you can, you can do a lot with that data. 
you can search for it. It's like Excel, but then visual. So this is the map that we were working on, for example. And one thing that was really nice to do is that you saw in Onyx, I was actually looking at all the properties that were owned by Cornell and drawing a box around them. Well, in this program, what you could do is you could just search for all the properties owned by Cornell and just make the parcels red. Mm -hmm. So, and then turn that into a layer you can turn on and off. So a you lot less see here. Uh, labor and less labor because all the information is there. They have that map data. And what's also great about this area in general is because of the universities, and this is one of the reasons why we liked this area, is that they're they're very active in the area, and so yeah, they there's have, a lot of info. They have all their the county has data. You know, all the counties have data and and more data than what the state would have. So you could get really granular and we started getting, um, we started to really nerd out on this stuff. It's really, it's really cool. I mean, once you start to know how this works, then you can do a lot. So all the green you see here are state parks and state forests. So you see a lot of that here and here. Mm -hmm. All the purple is Finger Lakes Land Trust. So then here, for example, we're zooming in on um, South Hill and you can also notice that in this program, you can also have you know, all these little images here are photos that I've taken. I'm not quite sure actually anymore how to like <laughs> pull those up. It's but so complex that it's sometimes a little complex. You, forget, you forget how to use it. So you need to like be in it all the time. Yeah. And, or just reference the course. Like mm -hmm. if I spend a couple hours in that course, I'll probably remember again. But you can see that all these photos here we are should link to plotted the course. on the map. We yeah, we will. Course, yeah. All the purple is FLT land. Um, so here you can see that... Another thing I did is that we were interested in parcels that were larger than five acres. So what you could do is you could set you could set a rule in here that it uh, that you draw the properties that are five acres and over a different color. So all the property lines that have darker colors here are five acres and over. Uh, the rest is just not interested to us. So you can see all these like smaller communities here uh, that would never be enough to house three to four families. So. Um, it brings all the properties that are a potential to the surface, which is really great. Actually, zoom out a little bit, if you can, because one of the things it's that... It's really complex. Yeah, but the things that we really liked about the area, it's still kind of filling in, is that the, you start to see this like little green, it's called the emerald necklace. It's like this green circle that kind of comes around Ithaca. And that became really interesting to us, and we learned about that through the land trust, that um, they were trying to preserve a lot of this area and we're like, oh, that's, you know, kind of cool. Right. Maybe it's not for us in order to do that with our land, but, you know, being a part of that in some way, shape or form was kind of interesting. And you might want to be a budding against some of that land or be part of that, you, you know, uh, worldview or that, that mindset. Right. Because a lot of what they're trying to do is preserve as much land as possible and also make trails that connect all those parcels together so that you can have continuous hiking trails throughout the whole area. And we already know like the importance of having contiguous land for wildlife, you know, so that wildlife doesn't have to cross roads or urban areas. And that's really important. So honestly, for us, like being in that mindset is really important. And that brings me to uh, go offline, go into the real world, because it's really hard to you know, sit indoors, like constantly look at the map and determine if, if a property is going to work for you, actually go and visit the place. Um, so what I've done is, uh, once I got a car, I would just drive around for a while in the area and I would just get a feeling of what the area is like, but I would also try to see if I could potentially talk to some people. Um, so this is a good thing to do if you're like out on a summer day and it's nice out. Most of the people are like outside working in their yard or doing something in their garage. So what you could do is you could just like stop at the side of the road, just say, hey, uh, make sure you don't go on their property or things like that. Uh, just have a conversation. Like, what is it like to be in this area? Hey, we're looking for some land, things like that. And see what it's like. I talked to a farmer the other day uh, that was able to like on South Hill, which is a very high uh, elevation in the area. And she was t talking to me about how in the winter, uh, there's a lot of really cold drafts that come in from the lake. Uh, so a lot of wind from the north. And since they're up so high on the hill, they get a lot of that wind. And then in the summer, the wind would come from the south, I believe. So and we actually mm -hmm. noticed that because there were some properties that had such sick outlooks. 
Yeah. And then we would go, you know, during the fall or whatever, and it was so chilly. Yeah, and we were cold. like, okay, this is not the place <laughs> that we want to be. And you really don't get those nuances until you're on the ground. I just want to clarify that when we were looking at land, it was primarily pre-pandemic. So just be mindful of that. Like during the pandemic time, you know, maybe some people are a little less um, interested in having you come and knock on their door. But like Sandra was saying, in the summertime, people are out, they're working on their in their yard. They might have a yard sale or whatnot. Yeah. And you just go and we chatted with people and it may seem a little weird because you don't know those folks, but everybody was so inviting and very helpful. And they would, you know, talk about their neighbors fondly. And that was always great for us because we're like, oh, we want to really know who's around us and how other people's views are of the, the neighborhood that they're living in. Now, another thing that you can do is that I noticed that when I was driving around is that I saw a lot of very interesting properties and you know, you're driving, so you're going fast and you're not sure, hey, who owns that property? Where's the property lines? Is that even available for sale? It's very, you know, it's very neck twisting to drive around and then uh, uh, try to figure out who owns what. So another th good thing to do is uh, bring your phone and just start taking photos out of your window. Uh, just drive a little slow. Obviously, if you can, like, if you get too distracted, make sure you, you know, stop at the side of the road. Usually these are county, country road, like county roads? County, yeah. County, county roads. roads. Country roads. <laughs> they, uh, country you know, and county roads. Country roads. That's what I was <laughs> looking for. All right. I'm um, actually we're really close to the property, but I just wanted to stop here to just show you the view because it's really nice. The sun is about to set. Um, yeah. There's not a lot of traffic there, so although you got to watch out, but... I would just take photos while I was driving around, even if I couldn't get a really good look of it. So I could come back home later and take a better look at the photos. And what I would do is I would load them into a program called Lightroom. And what Lightroom allows you to do is it allows you to capture the GPS data from a photo that you've taken and then uh, put it on a map. So I know a lot of other photo applications do this, so it's not just uh, specific to Lightroom, but here, for example, you could see I went for a drive and I just took photos and then later when I look back at it and I want to know where it is, I can click on the photo and I could see which photo relates to that. So that's a really handy tool for being able to know what specific areas look like from the ground. Especially, so you're not just looking at the satellite photo all Yeah, day. and especially if you're doing it solo. Like yeah. when I was there, I might be able to do it, but if you're just doing it solo, but... I mean, you've even pulled over on the side of the road sometimes yeah. to take photos. I mean, that was actually, really if you came with me on one of those trips, you could be taking the photos and I would be able to do the driving. Yeah. So that's obviously best, like have someone in the car with you to take some of these photos. But yeah, start collecting them and then uh, start building this library of photos so you know better what it looks like on the ground. Because there might be a spectacular view there that you have no idea that it's there. From looking at the top. I think what's really fun about this too is that yeah. you know you hadn't really lived here for a very long time right. and some people lived here for you know 10, 20, 30, 40 years and you really got a sense to the, know the map and the place oh, yeah, way eventually. better than some people who actually lived here for their entire yeah. lives. So And that's a good idea too yeah. is like you start to really get to know the area and you know that's great because you'll be moving here and that's going to be beneficial anyways no matter where you move. So it's good to know that. All right, getting to know the area. One of the best ways to do that is to actually go to town meetings. So... <laughs> boring. <laughs> boring, but... <laughs> helpful. <laughs> helpful. <laughs> and actually nowadays with the pandemic, a lot of those town meetings are happening on Zoom or they're just an email list with some of the minutes that they're... some of the talking points that they had in their meetings. So sign up for those. And I went to a couple of meetings and what I found out is, for example, you can find out that a, lar a large plot of land became available uh, in the town of Danby. So we were like, oh, that might be interesting. What if we propose our idea of starting like a small community there? Um, another thing that I realized from the town of Danby was that apparently they favor the White Hawk eco village that's there. It's like a tiny eco village with a couple houses in a circle. More than a couple houses. Like, yeah, more than a couple. Like a dozen or so. They have room for more. Yeah. And, you know, they seem to really prefer that because one of the things that they're trying to 
uh, battle is urban sprawl. Mm -hmm. So they obviously have Ithaca right there and Ithaca is just growing and growing and more houses are being built and they want to make sure that they preserve some of the natural areas. So they, they like it when uh, people buy a large plot of land and then only develop a certain percentage of it. And leave the rest of it open. Yeah. So yeah. learning about those things and getting an idea of what the what the towns and what the specific areas, uh, you know, what they're dealing with. You can learn about how the internet access is. Uh, at town meetings, there's a lot of people from the area, so you get to know what the people are like. Uh, you can ask them specific questions. Although a lot of times the people in the town meetings could be the loudest in, in the town, and so you don't yeah. get a really good litmus test. But it's also good to really understand who are the most engaged, who are the loudest in town, yeah. um, who are you always yeah. going to be bumping into, um, and mm -hmm. also what are you going to be bumping up against because you know zoning is a big thing, and if you're trying to do something that's a little out of the ordinary, yeah. even if like the town of Danby like, favored what we were doing, even if you're doing something out of the ordinary, would you be welcome there? Or would you have to apply for so many different zoning codes and cut through a lot of red tape and then you know, forget it, you're never going to envision and see your dreams come to reality because there's just too much red tape to yeah. cut through. I believe there's like a thing like a planning board and you have to, if you're building something, it has to go through them and it could take a long time. So knowing all that stuff is very helpful. And, and I would say <clears throat> also, if you can't make the meetings, they are required to put minutes up. Yep. So, you know, even somebody that I was um, looking mm. at who was proposing a little village, I never went to that meeting, but I looked it up and it was proposed to the board and I got to yeah. say, oh, look, at, <clears throat> how, did the, how did the people within that meeting actually respond? Because if the, the minute taker is actually really good at taking those minutes, uh, then you'll be able to get a sense of what it is, even if you can't, uh, you know, yeah. be there. And you can find out a lot of stuff like, uh, just right now from meetings that happened in the past. So mm -hmm. one property that we were looking at uh, from in another town, after looking at some of the minutes, we realized that they were planning for months to put a big cell tower oh, right yeah. on top of the hill. Oh, Remember yeah, I that one? about that one, yeah. So that would have been like, <laughs> we would have bought that property, thought everything was super cool, and then all of a sudden months later, they, we start building like a huge cell tower like right on top of the hill. So yeah, that's and, something that we are able to, you know, and they have to require, they're required to make all this stuff public. So they had like sketches of where it's going to be, what property it will be on, They're required to tall, make that public, like, but your mm. real, their, their real estate agent or the person selling the land doesn't have to make that public. So right. if you're not doing your <clears throat> research, you might wind up with a big cell tower right next to you, yeah. which could be good if you want internet, but maybe you don't yeah. want that aesthetically or, you know. So again, none of this is good or bad. It's all about what you prefer. Like there might be no internet in that area or no cell phone reception. So having a cell tower would actually be a good thing if you were to move there. Another thing actually that I found out from meetings was in, you know, a town close to here is that I found out that they were gonna close a road because they had to repair a bridge. And, you know, that's also information that you can use to, you know, inform yourself like, oh, are there any backup roads that are decent that are going to get snow plowed in the winter uh, that if that road ever closes, that I'm able to have another alternative route to be able to get to where I need to go. That's it. Those are really all the tools that we're using. And then there's also other things that you could use um, once you're on the property. One really good tool uh, that I use for filming a lot actually is an app called Sunseeker. And when you look at Sunseeker, uh, it tells you where the sun is in the sky. Uh, this is used for filming because if, you're, if you want to catch the last golden hour light, you want to know where it's going to be and for how long. Uh, but what you could do is you could click on 3D view. And now when you rotate your phone around and you point your phone to the sky, as I'm doing here, you can start to see where the sun is in the summer and in the winter and at what time it sets. And that's, for example, very handy. If you're looking at that property with the big hill and you wonder if that's a concern, you pull up the Sunseeker app and then you look at the sky and you're like, okay, that's where the sun is right now. That's where it will be in the winter and that's gonna be behind the mountain. So that's a great app. Yeah, and um, that's also really yeah. helpful when you're like citing things. So if you're like, oh, I really want to build right here. I want to put a greenhouse or I want to put a conservatory. Is that going to be the right place to actually put that? Um, you know, maybe that's the only place that you could build and you find out that it's not going to be the optimal place. And then that, you know, that property might fall a little bit lower on the list. 
I'll say another one that we actually used and I mentioned in the last video is like mm. soil web. So if you wanted to get a oh, sense yeah. of like, what is that soil underneath your feet without having to like stick a, a shovel in there or to actually pull up an acre value map, you know, that is, is actually very helpful. Is that the app that we use to figure out that in our area it has a compaction layer underground? Um, yes. Because it will have yeah. a lot of data yeah. because like what we find out is that here the soils are not draining as well and it's because there's a very compact layer like 12 inches under, mm -hmm. under the ground. So, you know, it gives you a lot of information about the land. Yeah, and, and that actually also elucidates a little bit more of the geology of the land as well because yeah. uh, the land around here has some really interesting topography due to the glaciers kind of coming in and then retreating. And so in some areas they have like karst topography and moraines and, uh, and, and a number of other geological features. And it could just be from like a glacier just sitting here compacting all the soil and then when it, once it receded, it kind of left the land really compact. So those are really good things to know because hey, heck, we went out there and we started to stick a shovel in the ground and we're like, whew, this is hard. Oh, it's hard to <laughs> dig in. And yeah. another thing is, uh, you know, you might find an area that looks great, but then you realize that there's a lot of rocks in the soil. Mm -hmm. And it means that if you're gonna dig anything out, like a pond or a basement for a house, that you're gonna run into a bunch of rocks, it's gonna take probably twice as long to dig, if not longer, and to dig that out. And it's gonna, Yeah, it's gonna be way more yeah. expensive that way. So, you know, you don't wanna hit a huge rock, you know, that you can't get around. So, and, it's, and it's good then, that's really good to know if you're like really tight on the budget as well, because you're yeah. like, oh, this, this land was super cheap, but then you realize all the work that you actually need to be putting into it, whether it's like from the, the buildings or the edifices there, or if it's just like the infrastructure, which there might not be any infrastructure. So yeah. all this stuff, very good to know when you're trying to find the homestead. And I have to say, it was some of the tools that I wish we had right from the get-go, but luckily we kind of learned as we were going. Yeah, so hopefully you're able to take some of these tools and have them from the start and know exactly that when you're looking at properties, you could probably find out in the next couple minutes if this is even worth for you to go look at or not. Yeah, and tell us yeah. in the comments below if you have tools that you used that are, have been helpful for finding your homestead, but those are ours. So over and out. <laughs> Bye guys. <laughs>